Okay, guys. Um, let's start with Umberto, right? Because we didn't hear your wonderful voice yet. Um, you can mix up the microphones, but not the glasses, right? <laughs> Uh, if you if you don't mind, we should talk about how can NOCs maximize opportunities in unconventional oil and gas. Yeah? Now that that gives you a platform from here to Texas to talk about. Um, give us give us a five minutes. Well, um, uh, the the unconventional exploration is being developed well he, here in the states. Uh, us as uh, their influence from the states, uh, it isn't. It impacts uh, what we are doing, and of course, it impacts the markets we 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 cover. And uh, from our perspective, in terms of the resources we have in the country, we are um, we have structured in our strategy to assess the unconventional resources in our country. Um, we are developing a program in order to understand what we have in hand, what are the, uh, from the technical point of view, the, capa the, the, the potential we have in uh, the different source rocks in Colombia. And uh, um, see if we can establish uh, the possibility of having a economical um, development of unconventional in, in Colombia. Cheers. Welcome back. <laughs> we started without you and um, well. because I, I was not sure whether you disappeared. I have asked Leo to join as well. Oh, yeah. yeah. So we just talk less and they talk more, right? So that's that's okay, right? Um, yes. So you developed the program, you say? We are assessing. We are assessing currently uh, uh, in order to evaluate if developing non-conventionals would be attractive for us um, in, uh, uh, as a potential for, for uh, as a business potential in, uh, in the country. Mm. In order to do that, of course, we need uh, to develop more than technology, as Paul was mentioning, technology is not new. Uh, we've drilled horizontal wells, we've fracked as well. But we need to uh, see if we can adapt the model of unconventionals that have been developed in the US uh, to what uh, would be uh, the Colombian environment, which, uh, which uh, the unconventionals if you go from one place to another, um, the possibility of developing or, or developing unconventionals in one place or another depends a lot on the different uh, restrictions or the environment you have. And um, Colombia is significantly different than the US. So we do have specific um, problems to solve in order to see if uh, uh, unconventional resources can be developed and can be economical in Colombia. So far, technically, we've acquired information. We uh, see the potential in terms of the, the formations or the rocks we have, uh, the source rock we have in Colombia. What we have to see if we can build a model, a production model that makes, uh, ec uh, that can be economic. Yeah? Is, there is there a stress to your um, way to deal with all companies on, on the regulation, on the sharing, on you know how much you take? W one aspect before that, you have to solve all the social, environmental, and all the massive operations that have to be developed in order to produce uh, unconventionals. Um, uh, Colombia is not like in, in Texas or uh, down in Argentina where you have great uh, extensive areas, non-populated areas, where you can do, a, let's say, uh, an operation with minor social impact or visible impact. Uh, you have a huge amount of populations. You have um, environmental issues, environmental regulations that currently are, let's say, in adapting to what could be an unconventional um, 
developed. So uh, that's from that part, uh, the social impact, the visual impact, the massive operations has never been developed in Colombia. Mm. So that's a challenge. That's we a need challenge. to see how we, mm. we, we tackle that. If I may say, Cello, you, you don't have the same problems, right? You have a desert, which is big, which is wide, you know, um, you, know, you uh, don't bother anyone if you make a few er earthquakes <laughs> there, right? Uh, it's not exactly true. Yeah. Uh, the thing is, uh, the, uh <coughs> the area that has been uh, evaluated and assessed so far uh, with the existing data as conventional, did show that there is three areas. The um, southern Tunisia, which is part of the Gadamas Basin, where they have two major uh, world-class disc um, uh, source rock, the Tenezuf, hot shade, this is Silurian, and the uh, uh, what we call Devonian, I mean not Devonian shade. And this is Devonian, it's kind of a rich of uh, a carbonate. That's one. And also the second one is north of what we call Film Zanash, which separate the uh, Paleozoic uh, sequence, uh, succession, uh, which is located south within the border of Algeria and Libya. And the north. This is another uh, Silurian. It's called Figgira formation with Silurian shale, and uh, there is a certain level of hot shale. These are two uh, Paleozoic resources. The others is within the what we call the Pelagian platform, which is uh, 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 including a lot uh, huge area in the in the Pelagian platform uh, offshore Tunisia, and this is has another potential. The uh, what we call uh, the Cretaceous Cenomanian Age Bahlul formation, very rich. Mm. This is uh, oil shade uh, uh, potential. Uh, basically, on Are what has been done testing from certain yeah. levels with conventional uh, conventional wells during the 80s. Uh, uh, these these two aspects for the southern Tunisia, the challenge is uh, you are in the desert. Uh, in Sahara with uh, dunes, high dunes, the environment is very uh, critical in terms of uh, uh, there is uh, oil and gas company like ENI and Hanadarko are, are doing their job in terms of uh, protecting the environment uh, d with, uh, with a very, very high level of uh, professionalism in this way. The uh, resources on water resources are very limited as I mentioned because it's uh, there is a huge fossil aquifer. Uh, if you uh, put something 20 or 25,000 uh, cubic meters per well, and with uh, 200 of wells, you know, this is a huge amount. So there is certain assessment has to be made in terms of agriculture uh, resources, water resources from agri ag our agriculture department. Uh, as well as for the others, the one is in uh, Northern Telems and Arsh which is uh, related, uh, it's located near Oasis, and the Oasis have a lot of need of uh, uh, water to uh, get them, you know, the beautiful Tunisian date, uh, which uh, they call the Nour date, which is very, very nice and transparent. Uh, uh, <laughs> you could, you could see, see through it, very, very, very nice. It does, they are completely different from the Middle East dates anyway. Mm. Uh, for the other, for the other side is the area what we call the Pelagian platform, where you have a lot of population. You have uh, 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 olive trees field, almond field, where also the impact on environment. So, more or less, uh, uh, there is two two strategic uh, assessment has to be made, and they are in progress. The one, the first one, is with the envi environment environment. Uh, assessment of the uh, how to deal with the uh, ETAP's approval of any coming contract with conventional uh, wells and conventional wells. So they, they believe that they have to need to, they have to get uh, uh, an assessment on environment impact with the unconventional industry uh, to try to preserve the uh, uh, aquifers, the um, uh, agricultural water that they use for uh, to, 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 to uh, keep active uh, this, this, uh, these fields. And the other side is uh, uh, trying to uh, assess the, the volumes of water, whether they will be going for desalination of salty, the, uh, uh, the uh, 
seawater or uh, will go to this? I mean, using, you know, this is resources, this is key issue mm. for developing, you know, in terms of technical <laughs> aspect. Paul, uh, if, I, if I may ask you the question. Can I, be before I do that, can I, before you ask the question, I yes. just sound a note of warning to any national oil company thinking of going into unconventionals. The main characteristic of unconventional oil and gas is it's highly differentiated. Different plays are totally different. Wells on the same play are totally different. And mm. what that means is, if you're going to try and develop a learning by doing curve, you need to do an awful lot of work, an awful lot of drilling, which is what happened in the United States. I suspect for most of the companies in this room, this is not a realistic option. Yeah, I mean, I, I almost went in the same direction with my question. My question is, um, we consider Middle East, North Africa to be the filling station of the world in terms of oil, right? Now, everyone has this dream about unconventional because in the U.S. somehow it's, you know, became interesting. So why, why is Middle East, North Africa getting excited about unconventional if they have a lot of conventional? Precisely. I mean, hey, it's, it's, it's a question. It's, 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 you have to answer. Yes. I, I, don't yes. I don't understand why um, <laughs> the sort of, if you're sitting on huge amounts of conventional oil and gas reserves, why you would be that enthusiastic about unconventionals, unless you have a, a sort of fixation on technology for the sake of technology rather than producing anything else. Yeah. Leo is uh, jumping on the microphone. I think he has a word burning in his mouth. I, I don't think it's a fixation, if I may say. It's a misunderstanding of the technology. Uh, it sounds a great idea from the Middle East point of view and North Africa, but they, uh, you have to study, as we've said, over the course of today, the exact characteristics of unconventional type oil uh, and the political structure of the United States, the infrastructure is there, the mum and papa uh, outfits, uh, the low taxation, and all, the, all these factors. If you're talking about NOCs, you're talking about a different, if, if I may say, animal. Um, you, you're talking about state-owned, state-driven companies, but they themselves, their strategies are confused because if you want to run a tight operation, you act in a certain way. If you're acting as a fiscal um, <coughs> unit that pulls in uh, a lot of funds for the government, then you act in a different way, and, and they are pulled in different directions. Whereas the United States, it's a unique case, um, even compared with Europe, as, as you said earlier. And, and why NOCs are even thinking about this, $50 oil, for example, the cost, I don't know if Paul agrees and the gentleman here. Our calculations when I was at the CGS um, indicated that tight oil is around $50 a barrel fully built up. The tar sands are, are higher still. So the, the reason why these uh, oil fields are being developed is because the price is at $100 plus a barrel and taxation is low. Uh, if, if you have conventional oil, why on earth would you bother with this type of expensive oil is beyond, I think, the mind of the panel. Now, we, we, we can see that um, big players like BP and, and Shell are focusing on deep water. Um, I would even say they put the, uh, the, the, the shale outfits in the back burner. Yeah? They, they don't consider them to be really the cash cow. They want to focus on where they get a bigger margin, which is deep water. Um, if I look on the four biggest developers in North Dakota, in the last four years, you have almost every year that their capex is higher than the revenues they make. That means they are accumulating losses. So I'm wondering, um, you know, eventually it's going to work out, but it's not the big, big booming profits. But uh, eventually it's not going to work out because when the interest rates go up, and notice I say when they go up, an awful lot of the shale gas operations in the United States will go bankrupt. They're so highly leveraged. The whole shale gas revolution was built upon a mountain of debt. Uh, and uh, with a world of higher interest rates, they're going to be in very serious trouble. As for the big oil companies, they came very late to the game. And the cynics in the United States said the only way you could really make money uh, in the shale gas revolution was to buy a lot of property early on very cheaply and then find some idiot to pay a very high price for it. And the idiots, of course, were the large companies. Now, I have to make us pause here because otherwise 
a few suicides happen and people get wandering, we are supposed to talk about unconventional and it doesn't mean we have to slash it, right? So is there maybe someone who wants to say something positive about Shilor or Shilga? Okay, there is um, a Noga question in the front. Looks like the world is divided. You talk to one half, they get all excited, the other one says, uh, <laughs> we have one side here. It's interesting. Anwar Khalafa from Noga. The, uh, you know, the question from the panel is why the Middle East is pursuing the <coughs> unconventional? And the answer is very simple. The IOCs are ready to fund and explore for unconventional. So they are doing it in Oman, they are doing it in Bahrain. If there are companies willing to come and explore and prove the unconventional resources, what's wrong in, in pursuing that? That's number one. Number two, the unconventional gas is a national strategy because most of the countries in the Middle East they are thirsty for gas. And that is a strategic. When you have the resources from the conventional, you better start early on that. So I bid to, to defer a bit to the panel. Leo, you want to jump in here? Yes, the reason why these companies are coming into the Middle East to explore for unconventional oil is that's the only part that they're allowed to, the only area to play in. The, the, the conventional oil is well understood and it's the prerogative of the state companies. So it is, you can understand why they're saying allowed to come in, so to speak, if you, in, if in my view. It doesn't make economic sense. Why should they? You because know, you very simply. Host, you, are, you as a host country, if you have people willing to come and explore and prove, it would be foolish not to pursue that. You're right. Now, regardless whether I open up the conventional story or not, you know, these are exploration concessions that are given up for unconventional and companies are bidding on them. You're, you're, right, ab you're right about that, but um, and, and I repeat my point that, that this is an area that they are both competent in and are deemed worthy of looking at to gain some expertise. The host government thinks that it will gain expertise in this. But in terms of economics, uh, it doesn't make sense for the host government to go into this kind of uh, business. Okay, let's let's come to the next question. Sorry, just trying to... Yeah, Gabriel Sulski, and Vitacom. The, um, in the Permian, I think there are a couple of cases in which the uh, conventional and unconventional production has been blended successfully in one exploitation. Do you think this might be uh, an idea for uh, Middle East? Paul, do you want to? No, 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 you have to fi use the microphone. That's a question for a geologist, not for an economist. Okay, <laughs> you have two next to each, uh, yeah? One left, one right. <coughs> now you are, you know. I mean, I mean, in terms of, uh, <laughs> I mean, in terms of uh, assessment and evaluation of the uh, the uh, the unconventional, we see, you know, I, I've I've been once to uh, the Eagle Fork, okay, and I I, I do know uh, that there is uh, the uh, all com all components to have success of the unconventional are gathered. First, you have huge amount of water coming out from the Colorado uh, mountains. And coming out with the uh, Grand, uh, uh, the Grand River, uh, Grand Rio Rio Grande, yeah. Rio Grande. Yeah. And this is, a, yeah. you know, I've seen the flood of water. Yeah. This is a very important part of the game. The you other like environment. You like that, huh? You like that, huh? For the day. I mean, I mean, without <laughs> water, you could not make make a conventional. Anyway. Exactly. This is uh, one of the ingredients exist very well, and it's uh, with abund abundance. The second thing is. Uh, the environment, <coughs> you see very little, uh, you know, very spread, you know. America is a very beautiful country, you know, very, very big, you know, and you, the uh, communities on the population is 
three, 300 million you know, spread and uh, eight, eight, uh, eight million square kilometers. This is very important. So they told me that uh, uh, since night 2008 and through uh, uh, end of 2012, uh, they were having a boom of construction, people are moving there, relationship and betwe between uh, international oil company and the owner are very important, uh, smooth. Some of them don't want you uh, to get any, any agreement to uh, do your, your unconventional work. Mm -hmm. It depends. If someone wealthy, you know, they don't load you. So some, some people, some other people are needing money and they, they see this is profitable and they, 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 they go, they do, they do it. And then the other side, there is technology to be applied. I mean, the sophisticated system existing in, in, uh, in America, if you ask for a logging unit uh, that will be coming out uh, by the few hours later, in the opposite, for North Africa region, if you ask for any logging tool, especially neutron or gamma ray, and, is, and is not uh, available, has been uh, damaged through fishing or uh, you know, problem in the, in the, in the hole, then you have to take to, to get it from Europe, from Italy, from someone else, which is taking you know uh, too much time. And this is will have an impact on economic aspect of the wells, mm. the wells, uh, the wells that will be you know, you know, as you mentioned, you know, you could go with the well and horizontal and doesn't 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 uh, produce any any economic or goes for prob probably 500 barrels of oil and then. You know, just uh, the production fell fell down into very easily. It's not 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 very easily to to, yeah. to handle this. So, are we having the adequate uh, technology and services in North Africa region and Middle East? This is a key question. Yeah. Umberto, you you may have a similar situation like in Europe in terms of uh, limitation, uh, uh, environmental and and infrastructure. So, uh, for you, do you feel this is economically viable? Well, first I, I want to to go back to the to the question, the previous question, in the sense that in some countries, when you have limited resources, the unconventional today may appear as the possibility of um, replacing the resources that are um, um, uh, being uh, produced. Uh, that's an example for, um, for Argentina, Vaca Muerta, in, in the southern part of um, Argentina that could replace uh, production of the declining uh, gas production they have. In the case of um, Colombia, we have something that uh, is an alternative to the exploration we're developing in the frontier basin. So uh, we have a very rich source rock with a very uh, comparatively unconventional Eagle Ford in the US or uh, Vaca Muerta in Argentina where the thickness of the source rock is a lot bigger and um, it could be an alternative given that the productivity we can achieve from the wells is um, attractive enough. So far we have not done any fracking. This year we're going to frack our first wells in Colombia, uh, vertical wells, mm -hmm. given that we have a significant uh, thickness there. And uh, next year we're going to drill the first uh, long um, deviated or horizontal wells to evaluate uh, productivity. Now in mm -hmm. terms of um, what you're asking on the environmental issues, let's say operational issues, they're not exactly like in Europe, where as far as I understand, uh, um, mm, the civil community is really against fracking and the implications that fracking may have on water resources and on environmental aspects. Uh, we've done fracking in Colombia. Um, our problem is more related to uh, developing an operation that's not been seen yet on the visual impact that could have. Um, we have, we, we comply with all the environmental regulations in terms of um, what is exploration and production in, in uh, the oil business. Uh, and we have a very long uh, history of production in Colombia. So from that point of view, I think uh, it's, developing a very, um, it's, a, it's very important to develop a strategy of um, communication and integrating all the uh, uh, lo 
local, regional, uh, national government and authorities in what is the, mm. the bid and also the community. Has the regulation been following the changes that are happening? Because regulation that is there for conventional is not necessarily the same for unconventional and people get excited about it that maybe as a citizen you're not well enough protected because you know the oil companies are always in how with the governments? Well in, in fact um, uh, regulation is being built to be honest in Colombia we don't have <coughs> a regulation complete regulation for unconventional because it's never been done there in fact as a national oil company even though we well we are a national oil company, but we are not the regulator. We are helping the regulator to establish <laughs> the, um, the proper regulations uh, to be implemented from the environmental point of view, also in terms of what would be the activity uh, needed uh, to be developed and um, what, um, in, in, in what, what fracking consists of. That's basically communication because that's one yeah. of the big myths, I would say, in terms of uh, impact. Uh, in in our case, in particular, our uh, objectives, uh, geological uh, terms, are relatively deep compared to other areas. So uh, we shouldn't impact. We don't impact any of the uh, water sources. We're we're talking about over ten thousand feet depth in order to be delivered to something like that. That's one of the big challenges we have in yeah. particular in Colombia. Let me see, is there a final question because we, we have another two minutes to go. So is there someone who wants to ask a question? Yes, yes, no? No? Well, is there something else? that is burning on your lips you want to finish off with? If not, then I thank you very much. <laughs> and it's, um, I release you now and you may go and I may stay and welcome Manuel Ferrara de Oliveira um, from